Hello, I'm Peggy Carruthers, Custom Content Manager at Food News Media, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Understanding the Digital Customer Journey. There's a constant stream of new digital technologies designed to help consumers connect with restaurants and retailers, such as mobile apps, online ordering, and a growing number of third-party delivery partners. There's also an increasing amount of new technology to help restaurants and retailers automate in-store processes, such as digital kitchen display systems and kiosks. Today, we'll learn about how business owners can connect these two fast-paced and even faster-changing trends to improve operations, grow their customer base, and thrive in a digital environment. We will be taking your questions at the end of the program. You can ask a question at any point during the webinar, so even though we will be answering them at the end, we encourage you to ask as they come to you. You can click on the dialog box in the upper right-hand corner and then click on the questions tab to submit. And now to begin, our presenters today are Jay Gillespie, Principal Product Owner, and Mark Harris, Senior Product Manager, both at Revel Systems. Jay and Mark, welcome. And now, Jay, please take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, again, there we are. Um, yeah, so this is uh, just a quick overview of just some of the businesses that Revel itself works with as well. So today, our goal is to kind of take you through the digital customer journey, uh, whether it's you know online, app-based, delivery, delivery, loyalty, or kiosks, uh, sort of the channels that your customers interact with are sort of ever expanding now because uh, it controls shifting to them, their expectations, and how they how you know them and how they interact with you are, are higher than ever. And digital is a new norm, and your customers' expectations are changing with that technology. And you and your staff, and ultimately the customer interacts with, has to it has to check a lot of boxes the technology that you use. So what does that mean? So more options and quicker decisions by the consumer means you have to engage them in, in multiple different ways now uh, than, tradition, than traditional ways. So today we'll try to guide you through that, uh, that digital customer journey. Uh, Mark Harris, who leads our consumer product line, will start us off with the consumer facing products that you'll need to consider and discuss the best practices and importance of these features. <clears throat> Great, thanks Jay. Uh, just some background on myself. I've been with Revel for about four and a half years. I have a background in enterprise software, and I've also uh, owned and run uh, restaurants as well. Um, so uh, I have some some experience at the intersection of the two. Um, I guess what I'd like to start with is first thinking about what's going on in in the in the world and in the market, and how this is affecting uh, merchants. Uh, trying to run a business. So I see a, a number of different levers uh, moving simultaneously and the merchants sitting in the bit in the middle, and that's that's you for most of you on this call, uh, trying to deal with this changing landscape. So first there's the consumers themselves. There have been behavioral shifts that have been building uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years and accelerating. And um, as I walk through this presentation, I'll, I'll go through these different areas in more detail. But uh, in addition to these behavioral shifts from uh, traditional consumers, you get different expectations. And, and these expectations are growing into demands as many people in the industry start adopting new technologies and respond to this consumer behavior. So this is putting the merchants in a, in, a, in a position where before it would have been kind of nice to participate in some of these technologies for efficiency's sake, but now it's becoming a mandate. Um, additionally, uh, many of the business models are evolving to respond to these uh, consumer demands. Now, overarching all of this is a competition, the competition only getting fiercer because of this technology push and because of these changing behaviors. Um, so people are either responding to this or not, and some are keeping up, some are being left behind. Um, and with this comes a drive for efficiency. So some of these uh, technologies are enabling uh, significant efficiency, and this is something that needs to be uh, uh, kept up with. Um, or again, uh, in, in, a, in a business with, with smaller margins, um, that, can, that can spell trouble. And finally, there's, there's the technology itself, which you know some people refer to as a, a tsunami, a digital technology tsunami um, that uh, merchants are presented with. And they have to figure out how to navigate this, how to respond to all of these levers that are um, uh, surrounding them. So talking a little bit about um, 
the behavioral shift. So what are some of the major behavioral shifts? Well, first of all, people are mobile and they often have a device when they're mobile. Um, so that's number one. And they expect people to follow them. Uh, they're online most of the time, especially for younger generation. Um, <clears throat> and they could be at home. They could be at office. Many people working from home. Um, they're in transit in many cases. Um, the the kind of modern world we're living in uh, is making people less patient. Um, you see this pressure on all these uh, delivery uh, services, for example. People want it now. They want things immediately. Um, a, a big thing, especially if you get down to Gen Z, is that often people prefer interacting with devices to people. Um, so how do we deal with this? Um, you know, it could be that, that they want just an efficient interface or even they want to take their time with an interface, um, but they want, they want to cut straight to the chase. They don't even want to interact with someone. Um, also, people are, are more trailblazing, especially in the younger demo. They're more aggressive at adopting new technology. Um, and some companies are taking advantage of this and some people aren't. Um, and also, which comes with this kind of um, transient kind of situation, and you see this especially with this um, propagation of these aggregator apps, you know, the Uber Eats, the Grubhubs of the world, you see, you see less brand loyalty. And so um, people are switching quicker. I mean, I many merchants that I talk to feel almost like they're becoming more employees of these uh, directory services, not so much... Um, uh, their own businesses with their own unique value proposition, their own um, desires to relate directly to customers. So how can merchants um, combat that kind of trend? It's a very interesting thing. Um, if you look at, at any metrics uh, in the industry, you know, you see that the standard kind of uh, well-known stats, which is that people are ordering off-premises more, um, and that uh, ordering and delivery are, are growing at an extremely high pace. Um, and, we'll, and the proje projections are they will continue to grow. Um, and uh, in many cases, people are, are starting to prefer that. So out of this kind of shifting behavior is coming expectations and demands. And so understanding this kind of digital journey um, uh, I think you you need to start to, to to recognize this. So first of all, first thing I say is 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 the you know people are thinking about their phone as a remote control for the world. Like, give me this, give me it now. Um, the other thing is they expect that uh, interfaces are following them everywhere. So uh, for uh, food ordering, for example, uh, you know a traditional register is no longer you know a point of sale is is not sitting there. Um, some people would say that the POS has left the building. I wouldn't go that far. I would say the POS is now mobile and it will follow the consumer wherever they go. Um, people expect some sort of app, whether it's a web application, a mobile app, whether it's a, a voice app through some, some uh, home system. You know, they're expecting uh, some sort of interface. Uh, again, and this kind of dovetails with my earlier comment around um, people's interest in, in interacting with machines many times more than humans. Although it's not always the case. It, you know, it, it would depend on demo and kind of the scenario in a store, for example, if there was an open register with someone ready to take an order, people are much more likely to go. If there's a line, they're much more likely to peel off and, and hit a kiosk or some sort of um, application. Um, the other thing is people want this thing whistle clean and easy to use, whatever these interfaces are. All the modern interfaces are starting, you know, in, in the restaurant industry, you see people on the software side um, poaching designers from companies like Apple um, who are thinking about the, um, the profile of the user, the persona of the user, and how to make life easy for that user. So they want things to be easy to use, intuitive, and even fun. And then finally, there's a pretty strong, I knew I talked a little bit about um, reduction in loyalty. So people switching brands very quickly, switching from one merchant to another. Um, one of the things that can mitigate that is, is catering to specific consumers. The more you can do to reward that consumer, to recognize that consumer, to, um, to speed up that consumer's journey through various tech techniques, 
um, the more they're likely to stick with you um, and they will reward your, your um, investment in them. Um, I also mentioned that businesses are evolving. So <clears throat> one of the you know pain points, um, and I remember it well from my days of, of, of running uh, restaurants, cafes, is, is this idea um, that you've got a tremendous amount of overhead. So how can you reduce overhead? Square footage is one approach. Um, also location and and you can you can mitigate this by uh, uh, more delivery more online ordering um, essentially removing the walls uh, of your establishment um, uh, you know delivery is is becoming kind of a, a an expectation more and more for a large segment of the population uh, there's a massive war amongst various uh, aggregators right now um, if you read the press you'll see that um, you know, I mean, you're probably aware, well aware of the kind of reach throughs that some of these services um, are extracting. And I don't, you know, reading the tea leaves right now, I don't see that going down anytime soon because they're being squeezed by Wall Street expectations, by investors to 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 turn uh, to turn profits and to 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 generate more revenue. And how are they going to do that? Well, there's a few ideas, but you know, one of the things is to take a big cut of the sale. Um, so, so that's, that's an issue there. Um, <clears throat> people are looking to streamline business operations in, in many, many different ways. Um, the, the most obvious ways you see are things like, um, kiosks, digital menu boards, uh, order queue systems, um, even some of these fully automated, uh, plays that have not done that well. Um, uh, some of the fully kind of robotic, uh, uh, cubby style uh, systems you've seen out there some but some of these some of these are starting to gain traction um, and you see you see more aggressive moves like ghost kitchens and things of this nature um, that are starting to gain some traction as well to again to deal with the kind of overhead issues um, and then and then again um, <clears throat> you know uh, uh, people are looking at ways to uh, um, gain efficiency um, through the business model by monetizing uh, their current customer base uh, in addition to uh, additional customers by trying to to figure out how you um, increase ticket size or frequency of ordering um, or drive brand loyalty. Um, so then how do you solve this? Well, what's come is basically a tsunami of technology. Uh, <laughs> some of you might recognize this kind of a scenario. Uh, where you've got this, you know, diaspora of uh, devices that you're being forced to manage. Um, so <clears throat> there's online ordering, native apps, web apps, voice apps, customer-facing displays, self-service kiosks, digital menu boards, all kinds of drive-through technologies, and the list goes on. You know, how do you respond to all these pressures you're facing, and how do you take some of this technology and approach, and what are some sensible approaches to this? Um, so the first is obviously uh, online ordering. Um, if you're not doing it, you need you need to do it. And and there's really two choices here: uh, your own merchant solution, or going with one of these kind of aggregator solutions, and um, or some combination of the of both, which some people are doing, depending on their their delivery capabilities, um, you know. So <clears throat> if you choose to go with your own merchant solution, it comes with a lot of upside. Um, this is your own, um, you know, website or app that you can market to your customers. Um, you can get more information about your customers, which is often held back through the aggregator solutions. You obviously get more revenue because they're not taking the, the significant cut of the revenue. Um, you you can brand this, which you know re will resonate with some of um, these clients and start to create more stickiness for your brand uh, versus some sort of generic directory index, which you see uh, on, on some of these apps. Um, you know, and dr you can drive through uh, your own loyalty programs uh, versus kind of you know uh, becoming one of many uh, players. Um, there's also Auxiliaries to that, such as promotions and discounts, that uh, real-time couponing, geolocated uh, or geofenced, uh, that you can provide to your to your customers to drive more um, 
more revenue um, and, and, and through your own solution. So, I mean, these are some of the, um, some of the uh, benefits to, to running your own solution. Um, now, one of the big, the big pivot points here though is delivery, right? You have to figure out the delivery solution and you know, whether that's outsourced or through your own staff and, and whether you're gonna manage it all yourself or some mix of the two is interesting. I see some people running basically pick up um, and for here orders uh, with their own site, um, but they're linking out to third-party aggregators for delivery because they wanna offload the logistics, but they have to make some some calculations about, about the value of that and the cost benefit. Um, there's also the situation of um, if you're running online ordering solutions, if you have multiple uh, standalone uh, apps that you're you're supporting are these aggregators you know are they integrated into your POS or not um, and so that's if they're standalone you've got a lot of overhead you're having to deal with um, another another interesting pivot point in thinking about online ordering solutions is web applications versus native applications now it used to be that native applications were far superior to web applications in terms of speed, responsiveness, feature set, push notifications, things of this nature. But the web applications have caught up rapidly and, and now you're seeing a, a lot more parity um, with the web applications, especially on the mobile, the mobile versions. It's taking advantage of all the native functions of the phone, such as geolocation, et cetera. So um, that, that kind of battle is, is still raging to some extent, but you know, having a web application is um, usually economically a lot easier uh, to attack and maintain, and uh, additionally easy to, for your customers to get get going, basically, as opposed to having to go to Google Play or an App Store or something and and try to navigate that process. Um, <clears throat> Again, some statistics, if you look, there's many statistics on online ordering, but you know, you see ticket size bump by 20% plus, um, and you see a lot of people starting to prefer, actually prefer online ordering to, to in-house. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's one kind of solution for this kind of change in behavior and change in the environment. Another one is, is self-service kiosks, um, which I've been more and more interested in, and you see it exploding. I mean. There's many companies, larger companies, investing billions, billions with a B in kiosk solutions, um, and it's not by accident, and they're getting success. And not only are they getting success, they're getting success across age ranges, which was not always intuitive a few years ago, but it seems like, you know, whether you're old or young, people are gravitating towards these kiosk solutions. And so what do they do? Well, they can be a replacement for a traditional register. They could be a line buster. Um, I've seen models where people actually flip uh, stations from a uh, kiosk, uh, from, from a POS station, and then they start to cut staff because it's, it's not so busy. And they'll flip it into a um, self-service kiosk. Many places are just completely gutting all their POSs and, and just replacing the whole thing with kiosks. Um, it depends on the model of the business. Obviously, some work better than others. Also, you know, you would think this is tailored primarily to fast casual restaurant plays and quick service, but I've seen it in hybrid plays and um, whether that's a kind of a, a hybrid uh, uh, table service with fast casual components or also, um, um, you know, plays that, that straddle the line between a retail play and a and a, and a quick service or fast casual. Um, obviously, you're going to reduce labor costs. Um, you, you know, many cases you'll need some sort of oversight to monitor the stations and kind of deal with things that might arise, arise such as um, refunds or some sort of networking issues or something. But in general, you're going to you're going to drop labor 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 costs significantly. Um, and that leads to higher margins on the orders and also the more accurate orders. Um, you get a lot more accuracy. Um, there's one less in, intermediate intermediary, which is, is a cashier basically trying to interpret what you're saying. Um, and also because of the kiosk, you're getting a lot of confirmation pages. You can really inspect your orders and correct it if something's wrong. Uh, additionally, if you build in um, personalization into the kiosk, you can have, you can remember someone's past orders. And even if it's very particular, like gluten-free and no, uh, no this, no that, 
uh, you know, you can get it right and they don't have to, they don't have to explain themselves every time and be embarrassed by that um, as well as getting ac access to um, nutritional information they may want to know to, to, to make sure they're getting the right thing. Um, as far as kiosk configuration, there's a myriad of methods out there um, everywhere from kind of standard, um, you know, make your order and proceed to a register uh, where you essentially pay to, you know, pay right at the terminal with a credit card or some sort of mobile payment option um, all the way to uh, fully integrated cash machines. Um, so there's, there's this kind of diaspora and it's interesting as we move towards m less of a cash economy and more of a, a credit and kind of mobile wallet economy to see how this will develop. Um, obviously you can have scanners, uh, uh, printers, all kinds of peripherals on your um, kiosk. Those are usually optional configurations. And then of course you have, um, you know, standalone kiosks, which is kind of the more traditional route, or sometimes you'll see table side kiosks at TSR restaurants. Um, you know, this is um, also kind of an interesting, an interesting play with those kiosks are not the same. They have very different functions and, and, and kind of requirements. Um, but, but uh, both are, are becoming popular. Um, kiosk use is, is going up and up, and this is just skyrocketing, especially as people are trained. You know, this is in the same way I, you know, used to be in specialty coffee, and I, I people are always like, well, do you threaten by people like Starbucks? I'm like, no, they're they're training people on basically what the heck a, uh, a cappuccino is, you know, or, you know, an assemblance of a cappuccino. And, uh, um, you know, if I'm in a specialty coffee industry, that only helps me. Same thing with kiosks, you know, um, you know, many of these larger companies are training people on how to use this and, and, and merchants could take advantage of this. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll just mention briefly some of the, the software solutions that, that I've worked on um, to try to address some of these things. Um, one is a customer display. If you don't have a customer display on your registers, you should, um, it, it leads to nothing but positives uh, for your customers. Um, I know some people uh, don't go for that and go for swivel technologies and things like that to save money, but I think the relative pain for the gain is, is, is worth it. So this builds trust. You're seeing your order. It's very transparent. In fact, in many cases, it's, it's a compliance issue. It, has, it legally has to be there. Um, you, know, you know exactly what you're getting. You can con you correct things. You, you're not surprised by anything, especially if things like discounts or taxes or strange service fees are being added to things. Um, loyalty, you can build, bake loyalty right into a lot of these uh, customer display systems, including ours. Um, brand, you can push your brand. Um, that's a, you know, that's a major thing. Um, and, and I think an important thing for the customer to start to see it and associate uh, you with that brand, that branding. Um, and then of course it's a, it's a platform for upselling and advertising, which is, is a huge deal. You can get a 20% attachment rate to orders if you do it right. Um, some, just some, uh, quotes from the industry is that, you know, having a digital, um, um, customer display essentially can increase recall your brand by 40, 60%. They're just staring at this thing as they're sitting there. So um, <clears throat> that's something to know. Another thing we've worked on is a kiosk called Kiosk XT. This is, of course, fully integrated into the POS. You want to make sure that you're doing real-time price up, uh, adjustments and, and product adjustments and availability and inventory control. Um, you want to make this brandable, um, intuitive. It should be modern. Um, sleek, easy to use. Um, so UX and design have to be a major component of this. Um, and then you want to be able to do real-time updates and adjustments to these kiosks and all the things I mentioned before, such as hanging various peripherals off these, taking different payment methods, um, doing things like scanners and printers, etc. if you want to do that. Again, you know, depending on the flow of, of, of your establishment and you know, um, uh, what kind of experience you want, uh, you know, you would tweak that, that footprint. And finally, online ordering. Uh, first of all, this should be mobile first. So it should be responsive. Um, so we have a new generation. A, a lot of these products I'm mentioning are next generation products that we've been working on for a while and are just starting to roll out. Um, again, you're, you're, we've been thinking about branding. So your branding, not only should your branding be easy to do, so it shouldn't require you hiring a, uh, a designer, 
um, but it should also be kind of uniform across your different product suites. Um, should be mobile first, so uh, responsive apps is typically the way to go, meaning whatever device you you you, you put the uh, the application on, it'll render beautifully, uh, say a web application on a tablet or a computer or a, a mobile phone. It should be smart, so the smart systems are not complicated. The smart systems should be easy. Um, you know, easy is not, it's not actually easy. It's very hard to engineer and design. And so um, the easier a system is to use, most likely they had some very clever people working hard in the background to streamline that. Um, the look should be modern. And of course, you should be have a multi-store kind of function, whether it's store pickers using geolocation, um, uh, navigating different stores, opening, closing hours, and 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 metadata about the stores. Um, this is important, and then this should scale with your business. So, um, so that's kind of uh, in a nutshell um, uh, what I wanted to talk about there. The last thing I would say is that again, we developed a branding tool. That was our solution to basically push these branding assets to the different applications. Set it and forget it. Set it in one place, and 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 um, Basically, you can see preview how it looks and then push it out to these very apps, these various apps. So you get your same kind of look and feel uh, across the enterprise. Um, uh, yeah. And I think I'm going to now. So that's kind of, I guess, I would say the kind of consumer end of things, um, which has really been my focus uh, for a little while here. But I want to turn it back over to Jay to talk a little bit about um the the operational aspects now um, and how uh, these digital technologies are having massive impact there. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so like Mark, my background as well is operations. So I've been with Rebel about four and a half years uh, with the professional services organization doing on-site implementations and trainings for customers. Prior to that, same thing, software consulting and then operations before that in the hospitality industry working on the side that you guys might be sitting on taking the orders, et cetera. Uh, I've kind of seen it sort of grow up from pen and paper through what we have now, and it's it's night and day different. So, um, but yeah, I want to talk a little about the in-store and a little bit of uh, uh, out-of-store, off-site, off-premise uh, business, and a little bit above store here and how your customers are interacting. One thing Mark's touched on as well is that um, it goes back to kind of a little bit of your digital presence often being sort of your first and then last impression to your customers. It's It's more and more of that now it used to be you know they had to come to your store and you meet them and that'd be their first impression of their business or you might they might see a menu or so, even beginnings even 20 years ago might be a website now it's all these new technologies these digital presences the online ordering applications uh the delivery management tools that we might use are these oftentimes the first impression of your uh of your customers to your business now that's how they find you um, that's where the branding tool Mark was showing there too was also also very important. So it's your brand first. So once you get them in the store, though, the kitchen display, as again digitally, obviously this is uh, back of the house, but your customers interact with this a little bit too as well because obviously now you can have the ability when orders are done, if you're over the counter, to text message your customers, let them know the order is ready. It provides a very low touch, um, low touch interaction now with customers, and as generation. As the generations come on, millennials, whatever you want to call them, start coming in, that becomes more and more important. Uh, personally, I still like a little little human touch, but you have to be able to offer both, right? You need to have a low touch environment. You need to be able to come in. Uh, they need to be able to order online, come in, see. You can have a display system showing them where their order is in place. Uh, the kitchen display, obviously, the kitchen's managing this behind the back of the house. They're getting done. The customer's getting a message, letting them know their order is ready. You get to smile and say thank you, and that's about all the interaction you might get from a customer uh, on certain days or with certain types of customers. So that's it's just more and more important that those those technologies that you're building within your point of sale or whatever technology you're dealing with is also just keep in mind that it's customer facing. It's not just you and your staff that are interacting with it as well. It's from, from kitchen to customer basically is how that works. Uh, kitchen displays obviously offer for you guys from an operational standpoint a much better speed of service, real-time analytics. You actually, once you get rid of paper, obviously everybody knows about saving money on the paper, but what they don't know is operationally being able to look and, and have insights into your business as well and seeing, you know, being able to, the, the speed of service is more and more important now with the new, new types of customers coming to your business. Um, being able to understand how long your ticket times are going or from, from station to station, who your top performers are. And obviously, there's a lot of labor savings involved with that. And obviously, order accuracy. 
uh, that, that comes from that as well, which is a key important when, when you're talking about engaging with your customers. So kitchen displays play a big part in that. Delivery management is next. Obviously, it becomes more of an delivery is becoming more of an expectation than sort of a niche or a nice offering. Um, I'll spend some time discussing some of the differences maybe between the third party applications and something maybe if you wanted to offer it natively and how that consumer experience might differ. Um, the large change are really adapting to this at a faster rate as they have the finances to do so and, and they can build their own applications now. And so like some, some of the smaller and medium sized businesses, which you guys may fall in, you may be an enterprise, you may be one or two locations, but um, they're adapting to it slower, right? They didn't have the means to build it themselves in the past. And we're, but lucky for you guys, I mean, there's, there's a big push in our industry to sort of solve this problem for, for smaller merchants, mid-sized merchants, one location up to 50 to 100 to 1,000. There, we, you know, there's a pain point that comes with using the third-party aggregators. There's a lot of benefit as well, um, but we want to make sure that people are in our line of work. We're trying to make sure people have options, right? And obviously, want to do that, and especially people who haven't maybe traditionally done delivery in the past. You know, non-pizza operators or non-typical delivery operators. You, you know, you guys may be now adopting this new this new way of reaching your customers, and that has to be frictionless and it has to be easy to use. For you and your staff, otherwise you're just not going to use it, right? You're going to stick with the third-party aggregators, and um, we want you to be able to use these these, these features. Okay, um, a bunch of you guys have probably thought about bringing in these platforms for good reason. It's like a, it's a seven billion dollar industry, so it's it's not really going anywhere. It's not a trend. Um, most of you probably operate a business, uh, may have offered, may have probably have people come in every day, say, "Hey, when are you going to get on Uber Eats? Hey, when are you going to get on DoorDash?" When you're getting on Grubhub, consumers like interacting with those things because they're easy, friction, frictionless. They remember my previous order. I can click five buttons and I got my order on my way, right? Um, natively, now, now though, the, the, the other technologies like us and Rebel or other ones are catching up and making this, you know, this sort of interaction for the consumer uh, just as frictionless with something that, that you might be able to offer natively and don't have to come out of a pocket for 20 to 30 percent uh, for every delivery that you have to make. Um, you know, consumer experience for these these third parties are inconsistent, to say the least. Uh, you know, I can we've interviewed hundreds of different operators over the year, over the year, and some speak glowingly of the drivers they interact with and their customer satisfaction. They're great. Others have just horror stories that make you wonder how it's used by anyone. Um, important thing to remember is just that one: you don't own the customer experience or the customer when using a third party aggregator, and you're paying a high cost. That you also have no choice to push that cost uh, uh, to your customer as well. Your margins simply aren't high enough to avoid that. So you have to consider where that comes out of, right? Does it come out of a marketing budget? Does it come, does it make my now $14.99 special, maybe now $20, and does this become prohibitive for you? Um, for you guys, for, for most people who are considering taking on delivery or even considering the third-party aggregators or doing it natively, I've seen people, and I've recommended in, in the past, where you know, oftentimes it's uh, beneficial to say, bring on the, the aggregators first, right? Kind of test the market. They'll go find you customers. Uh, as well, which is one of the big benefits of them, obviously. Uh, you can test the market with that while you build out your own native uh, solution using one of the technologies that you have or something like Rebel Systems. Um, they'll help you gauge the market, and they're month-to-month, -month, they're SaaS, SaaS companies, so you can most of them you can kind of cancel any time. So just think about that. Because uh, despite the popularity of those apps, I mean, it's been well documented that, and some of the stu studies have shown that 81% of restaurant patrons prefer ordering from the restaurant's website. They like interacting with the brand directly. Um, most people do. Uh, they, they just prefer it, right? But they just has to, the problem is when you're interacting with a brand directly now, oftentimes it's just not as easy to use. Um, and that's where all those features that Mark was talking about before really come into play and making it sort of a, a frictionless effort for them. Um, anything, driver tracking applications that are customer facing, similar to what the delivery services provide, should be on the roadmap or already natively within some of the systems that you're looking at as well. Same thing for Rebel. Once you get the customer, uh, you know, some sort of CRM, making sure that you know your guests, making sure it's important to people now, making sure that you're able to, that they know when I come into a restaurant or when I come into a location, that you know who I am. You know what my preferences are. Uh, you know when I've come in the past, you know what I've spent. Uh, you can create and, and you can reuse this information, to get this customer information, obviously, to market marketing campaigns and increasing repeat visits. Um, the CRM, the CRM is a key and key feature now of interacting with your customers in this digital journey that they have, and they're expecting this, right? Uh, they're they're expecting you to know their favorites, they're, to make valid suggestions, and allow allow them to reorder easily uh, within minimal clicks as well. 
And that's where a CRM feature really comes into play. It gives you real actionable data about your customers. And just knowing who I am is just really how brand loyalty is built. Loyalty as well. So loyalty is sticky, right? It brings customers back. If you're not, if you don't have a loyalty program right now, please, you need to really consider one. Um, it's sort of table stakes now, and it's really the way I've seen it. The way the way people get the most benefit out of it is, is it's if it's simple and easy to use and easy to understand, um, you get more people coming back. Uh, you know, the, the loyalty increase, and you see the statistic here, loyalty increase of 7% can boost lifetime profits per customer by as much as 85. The people bring customers back. Um, loyalty members refer to, you know, 82% of loyalty program members refer to at least one person. Uh, refer to at least one person. If you have 100 loyalty customers, uh, 82 more guests are walking through the door now. So how do you do that? You know, what, what, what are successful programs that you offer? Something that's easy to use. Again, frictionless. I understand completely what I need to do to get a reward, I understand, you know, oftentimes based upon a spending trend or based upon certain products that I can buy, and, and you guys can really control that as well. The customer display system that Mark was referring to earlier really comes into play here because I want to be able to, you have to be able to allow people to sign up for these programs very easily. And again, again, make that sure that's really easy to understand as well. And that's where the sort of these customer facing pieces come into play, especially the customer display. Um, you don't want people having to fill out a piece of paper or anything along those lines, right? Your, your technology needs to be easy to use. So, you know, being able to prompt people through the sign-up process, being able to make sure, do they have to have a card? No. Do they Can they use their phone number each time or some sort of unique ID to sort of gather points and redeem points and all that, working with through the customer-facing display? So there's not seven questions coming over the counter from uh, an order taker or a cashier. It just makes it easy. Uh, easy to understand, easy to sign up, and easy to accrue and redeem points. Um, so the digital journey for the customer really does not end when they get to the store. All these different platforms that you're using are communicating and guiding the, they're really guiding the consumer through their experience. And again, ideally a, a frictionless one. Um, the vast majority of, of, of customers really, really care about the ease of use rather than what's actually being offered. Oftentimes, as long as it's just simple to understand and I know my goals and how to reach and redeem, uh, that's what you that's what you're really striving for here. And again, that's where the customer facing displays and some of the technology that interact with really come into play as well. Um, mobile order takers as well. Again, we're talking, you know, kind of wrapping up some of the in-store experience from your customers on a digital journey. It really doesn't stop when they come in, right? You, uh, you, you, you have all these different offers, offerings and ways to interact with your customer digitally through the kitchen displays, customer facing displays the delivery management feature that might be natively wrapped into whatever technology that you're using. And then obviously, of course, the CRM application that's, that's tracking what these customers are spending, doing, and how, you know, what, you know, knowing them and your customer being able to market to them as well and understand them. Uh, mobile order takers are a big part of that as well, whether table service or quick service or even retail. Uh, they allow for these frictionless interactions uh, and, and hopefully a handle the extra volume, volume that you're gonna bring in through the store, right? People walk by the store, go walk by the restaurant, see a long line out the door. They're going to keep walking, go to the place a lot. A lot of the times, even though they may prefer to eat at your place, they'll go to the next place because they only have so much time for lunch, right? That's from mobile order takers and things on those lines come into play. Uh, they can help line, bus lines. They can help. You can have one one single person kind of come out behind the counter, interact with your customers. And again, remember, your customers are now interacting with this technology now. They're they're look they're using. You're actually handing over your point of sale to your customer. They're signing. With it, they're entering a tip on it. They're they're declaring whether or not they want a receipt or what kind of receipt. Do they want an emailed receipt or a text receipt? So they're interacting with this technology in a way that they really have never had before. Uh, wherein it's just not for you and your staff anymore. It's really and every time you build something or buy something, some of this technology that has to be considered that they're interacting with it more and more, and it's less and less just you and your staff. It's more about them. Uh, Line Busters offer a ton of uh, benefit, obviously. Speed of service is the easy one. Uh, you can really go out and meet your customers where they are. Uh, allows a sense of security as well. The credit card never really leaves their hand, uh, which is a, an important thing. And it's more and more EMV and, and sort of the, the European way of taking payments comes over here to America. That's going to become not just a nice to have, but becoming an expectation and a, and a mandate um, from there. And then just and ultimately increases revenue and more tips. Uh, a lot of people get concerned about using more order takers about, say, like, you know, killing the kitchen or, or I'm, I'm over ordering or along those lines. 
um, you know, making sure that you're working with a system that can sort of pace these orders into the system, uh, into the into the into the back office or into the kitchen, and and people can do that, right? So you can sort of uh, throttle in how things may show up in the kitchen based upon what time they order in, so you don't actually kill the kitchen as well. There's ways to avoid that, but these are these are the digital uh, technologies that your customers interact with inside the store as well. All right, so what are some of the key takeaways from today? Uh, there's a behavioral shift in how consumers are you know, fine and interact with your business. The, the digital experience for your customers has moved from a nice to have to a must to have and it's staying there. Um, one of the biggest challenges you'll have and the questions you'll need to ask as a business now is, you know, how do I create, how do you, how do you create the int intimacy of the past interactions in a digital age, right? How do you still get people to, to treat your brand with loyalty and to really have an intimate relationship with your business? In a digital age, and and that's where these tools and these technologies, when you when you're considering them and you're reviewing them, you really have to look into that. That your consumers are facing these, and how does it delight them? Right? Does it easy to use, and do they enjoy using it? Because they ultimately they want to interact with your brand, not some other third party to get to you. They want to interact with your business, um, but there's been a barrier in years past to to get that to get to that and, you, and, and more and more people, this is becoming more and more easier. And that's really one of the key takeaways as well. And trading that fine line between convenience and technology while sort of maintaining a human element and high level of customer service, uh, those are the ones that will have the most you know, successful and engaging consumer facing programs and, and be able to navigate this sort of fine line between intimacy and technology that where you and a lot of business operators are trying to navigate as well. And that's really all we have for today. So I guess we'll open it for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Jay and Mark, for all that wonderful information. And now we'll turn to questions from our audience. Please use the submit functionality on your webinar console to ask a question. You can just click in the dialog box in the upper right-hand corner and then click on the questions tab. We do have a couple to get started with. So first off, how does AI figure into the digital customer journey? You want to start with that, Jay? Yeah, I can start with that. So artificially, so yeah, it's it's coming up. So basically, the ability, the, so the analytics, that's going to play a big play in that. Being able to understand again, understanding your customers, understanding uh, how to pace those orders that are coming in as well, uh, especially in like delivery management features that we, at least Revel works with as well. AI comes into a big part of that. Uh, being able to route your drivers uh, in an accurate way based upon past experiences or past, uh, past, you know, being able to take into the fact that where traffic's leading them and all that and being able to assign the appropriate orders to them. Uh, it's a big play in the AI industry and in the AI part of this and, and, and getting, getting routed appropriately. Yeah, I would say from a very high kind of bird's eye view, um, what the, the promise of AI and machine learning, which is kind of a subset of it, is to simplify life for the merchant, uh, in this case, um, to not spit tons of data at them, but to make decisions about that data and good decisions uh, based on past experience. A few examples, um, you know, some of the products I've worked on, um, kiosks, for example, uh, Self-service kiosks, upsells have become a big deal. Uh, recommendations and upsells. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's many different ways to do it. You could do it brute force. Like you could basically create a combo object um, and say, well, if you order a hamburger, select a, a, a Coke. But you can do more sophisticated things, such you know, more like the Amazon model, where I'm putting things into a cart. Okay, so we have a cart. Uh, uh, any e-commerce site has a cart. Um, and now I'm looking at patterns. So, okay, if, you, if you've if uh, you ordered this or put this in your cart, then you might really like to buy this. And if you present it well, um, you get a 20% attachment rate or something. Um, so that's one way. Another way is just to look at the history of uh, the buying history. Uh, you know, I talked about personalization. Well, with personalization, it means I have an order history for you. Well, that order history is a, a massive data set um, and you could use that to make recommendations and things that the customer is genuinely uh, interested in and very specific to that customer. Um, another thing is, you know, all the voice ordering you see, um, uh, there's a lot of AI built into some of the chatbots that you'll see around um, either online ordering 
you know, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, reservation systems, um, and even customer support uh, if your customers have issues. Um, so that's a that's another um, kind of uh, major area. And another thing is um, around uh, the apps. The you know I mentioned the phone as a remote control. Well, you know, looking at where people are located uh, relative to store proximity, you can basically do a suite of recommendations based on that and try to attract people to buy there or even come into a physical store. Um, you know, so those are those are some applications of AI and machine learning. But I think, in general, the the, the target here is to simplify. Um, I, I used to work in the bioinformatics industry as well, and we had the same issue. You know, you have a tremendous amount of data being produced in the world through experiments, and you no human can actually interpret all this data. It's kind of like all this kind of sales data or inventory data coming in or the comp the, the, the data associated with sales versus um, staffing. Um, you know, at some point, it's just very difficult to manage that and optimize the business. And so you can build intelligence uh, uh, to try to interpret that and make life a lot easier. Um, so that's the promise. And I think it's starting to happen um, and it'll happen more and more over the next five to 10 years. Great. And what do merchants need to consider as they add third-party applications to their POS? That's a good question. So I kind of want to touch on a little bit earlier, but I want to, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, one, are you ready for delivery, right? And ultimately, what's what's your end result? What's your end goal? Is it going to be to do this natively, or are you going to be able, or do you wanting to do this yourself as the end result? Because because ultimately, you got to remember you're you're paying for these customers, right? And it's a good marketing program, and you, and you can bring these customers in, but you're gonna you're paying for them, and does that come out of your marketing budget? Uh, and what what goes towards that, right? Um, are you if you raise your prices to sort of for those particular types of orders, does it price you out of the market? So those are really really heavy things to consider as well. And are you willing are you willing as a brand or as a business to let that customer experience go to somebody else? And in many ways. Um, there's a lot of benefit to those. There's, there's real downside as well. Um, and like I said before, what I usually recommend is if you're th considering it, try to consider doing it yourself down the line because then you'll own the process. And the, there's features that these POS systems like us are, that are offering that are making this easy for you to do, ultimately easy for you to manage. Um, that, that make it, and it's the same customer experience uh, for the customer as well. Uh, that these other part that these other systems uh, offer, like Uber Eats and DoorDash, et cetera. So, I would, that. yeah, I would add a couple things. Also, and number one, I mean, one of the real gold that that that, that you can mine as as a merchant is is the the customer data that's coming in, right? So, I mean, these are your customers, and you know, um, uh, even in the age of GDPR and some of the California regulations, you can you can. You know, we we've built opt-in um, to, to to receive marketing, et cetera, uh, uh, when customers give you their data. Um, but this is information that you can use. You know, um, and, and I mentioned the order history, all these things. I mean, these are things that are locked up by most of these third parties. And you know, you can you can take advantage of the the hard work that you did to get this, you know, to get these customers, create a relationship with them and, and cater to them in the future. So I think that's, that's a big deal. Also, there's a pricing issue. It's not, it's not uniform, but some companies um, restrict the kind of pricing modifications you can do for the online presence versus your in-store pricing model, which may either annoy you or infuriate you, uh, depending on <laughs> Uh, the time of day um, and you know it may or may not work for you and and there's there's kind of varying policies out there but that's been another um, you know another hindrance and then yeah and then f to echo kind of what Jay was saying what are you trying to do here you're trying to create a relationship with these customers um, ultimately and and um, you know whether you're you know doing that directly with someone or working through a third party uh, a middleman, you know, may create a kind of a different relationship. So, who are some Revel clients you think are on the forefront of digitally engaging customers? We do have a few. I mean, we have depends. You know, that we have a. I think Fruit of Bowls would be a good one uh, that we work with. They have a really, really great loyalty, you know, program that they offer their customers. It's pretty really highly engaging and is really 
given them some great results uh, from that. Um, Particular is just one of the long the enterprise ones. Um, Stanford is one of our customers, and they have they use they're obviously <laughs> because they're Stanford sort of on the the forefront of a lot of technology and how they get that to interact, and they're often challenging us, you know, to 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 advance and, and to kind of keep up with them, which is great uh, in many ways. And how they're they're taking payments through RFID or different types of cards or or different programs with house accounts. Uh, they they do challenge us in, in ways that's good for us. It ultimately benefits our downstream customers as well because of their so technology forward or thinking right uh, along those lines um, and how they engage with their customers as well. And we have a lot. We have a, probably those and a few, a few large other ones that really consider you know Urban Gerberts who really have a good interaction with their their, their kitchen displays through their uh, punch loyalty uh, platforms as well that, that really engage their customers and keep bringing them back. Wonderful. And with so many POS kiosks and other tech choices out there, how does Revel differentiate from other competitors? Well, I'd say we've, from one of the benefits of being with Revel is that we've been around for a while, right? And a lot of our competitors, especially within the in the cloud space or the tablet-based space, are, are re relatively new and they're, they're sort of catching up to us. Uh, we've been around 10 years now and we're sort of a, a legacy cloud vendor and one of the first ones to say, you know, offer offline mode, which is sort of table stakes now, but back then was pretty inventive. Um, and being able to just, you know, our, our feature set is so robust now that we're in the a unique position of where we can take all of this, this high level reporting, the analytics that we have and all the different features that we offer and really take them just sort of to the next level, right? Like what, what Mark's doing with some of our, you know, online ordering platform and, and, and the customer display and the kiosk, which are features that we've offered for a very long time, which is much longer than most of our competitors. Um, and now we're, he's able to take them to sort of the 2020 and beyond uh, feature set where most of our competitors are sort of just sort of catching up to what we offered before. Um, and that's, a, I think, a pretty always often been a key differenti differentiator for us, especially in that sort of mid market. And also the fact that we deal with more enterprise customers than really anybody uh, in the cloud space or in the tablet space, uh, there's there comes a lot of there's a lot of um, enhancements or there's a lot of you know best best practices that sort of come from that. But having customers that you know have locations in the thousands um, means that we have the experience and the know-how to sort of handle the the one to two to three location and up to over a thousand. We can we can kind of do it all uh, and in between. Yeah, I mean, I I would echo that uh, the experience with uh um, larger enterprises uh you learn you learn a lot about scaling businesses and what works and what doesn't over time so you know revel's a company that i would say you can grow with i, I also think just our data models are really flexible so we have you know products and product modifiers um, you know, essentially customization with all kinds of options for defaults and variables and bounding, uh, et cetera. So you can create combos and all kinds of um, uh, upsell options that are, that are, um, you know, I think, I think very powerful and also accommodate, you know, rather than modifying your business to accommodate the simplistic POS, you know, you get the, uh, the POS to basically customize itself or in this case a kiosk or whatever online ordering to the um the needs of your business and those are two pretty different things um yeah great thank you and i think we have time for one more question are you seeing more guests using online and mobile ordering close to the restaurant or are they planning ahead and ordering from home or work that is a good question um i mean I've seen a mix, you know, um, there's a lot of kind of on the go, like I said, the, the phone is kind of this remote control. So, you know, I don't really think about them fixed either at home or, um, you know, at work, uh, oftentimes they're in transition, uh, and they're coming in and out and they want food to be ready just in time when they come in. So that may mean that they're halfway to your place uh, when, when they order. Um, so, you know, it's, um, I, I, I would say, uh, there's, there's no definitive, um, clustering. It's, it, it's kind of a mix. 
Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I think that's, you know, you have to have, an, again, the ease of use and the engagement. If you have something that's easy to use and it's sort of engaging, they can get their loyalty points redeemed right then and there. They'll, they might do it right outside the door just so they can get there and get in and, and get in, get out and go on their way, especially for some of the newer, gener younger generations as well. I think you'll see more and more of that where, you know, your your space the, and the footprint of your business actually can can reduce now. Uh, you just need to be able to be able to get those things out and engage with your customers uh, a, little, a little easier and less friction. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Jay, Mark, and Revel Systems for making this program possible and to our audience for attending. A recording of the webinar will be available soon. And you'll receive an email letting you know when it's up. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, everybody.